Welcome to Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zalewski. In this episode, which is episode five of season five, we're going to discuss six stories. We're talking about economic crimes associated with condo association board members. New legislation is coming out that might be dealing with it. We're also looking at the possibility there might be 8% interest rates in the United States, according to one of the leading bankers on Wall Street. We will also look at whether or not we are facing a dire situation condos in Florida based on what will happen in 2025, based on a law that requires reserves to be set aside. We're also going to take a look at why everybody wants to come to Florida, but nobody wants to stay in Miami. Another story we'll be dealing with is climate gentrification. Are you starting to see people move into higher ground? It is Miami going to basically be the, um, the example of what goes on nationwide. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with what do you do if you live in a condo and you have a troublesome neighbor? who breaks windows, threatens you, and does a variety of other things. Mr. Fackler, one of our um, podcast members, he's going to give us his advice, what he would do in that type of situation. So after the break, we're going to go ahead and get into our stories. Welcome to the CondoVultures.com podcast with your host, Peter Zalewski, a Miami real estate broker, Wall Street consultant, and expert witness. This podcast is focused on identifying real estate buying opportunities in the South Florida condo market, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. The CondoVultures.com podcast is not authorized by the South Florida real estate industry and will most likely annoy many of the region's talking heads. This podcast will feature straight talk and salty language that could be offensive to some. Please remember that part <sighs> past investment success does not determine future gains, especially in the South Florida's volatile condo market. For more information, please visit CondoVultures.com. Don't buy a South Florida condo, discounted or distressed, before taking a Condo Vultures correction tour. CondoVultures.com offers weekly bus and walking tours that focus on educating buyers on the how-tos of identifying discounted condos, analyzing the opportunities, and purchasing units. Every tour attendee receives a list of all condo projects in a particular market, a market assessment handout, and unmatched expert analysis. For more information on the condo correction tours, Please visit condovultures.eventbrite.com. This is Peter Zalewski of the Condo Vultures podcast. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And I wanted to alert you that if you have a property that you're looking to sell in the Tri-County, South Florida area, I would encourage you to reach out to Jenny Horta, a licensed real estate broker with cvrrealty.com. She's my partner. She's been in the business for north of 15 years. More importantly, she knows the market. She knows how to get a deal done. And she also realizes that it's more important to get a price that you can accept and sell the property rather than the hold firm on some price that's never going to be achieved and ultimately languish on the market. So if you're looking to do, do a deal that you want a skilled expert who can help you sell a property, reach out to Jenny Hortis at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859, or visit her website, cvrrealty.com. Welcome to Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zalewski from Condo Vultures. If you're tuning in this podcast, you're going to hear a conversation by former journalists talking about some of the biggest stories that have occurred in the last week or so. We're going to cut through the fluff, cut through the hyperbole, and give you, the audience, an idea of what's really going on in the market. I have three other journalists on the podcast with me this week. I've sent them all um, off two stories each, asked them to give them a read, and then we're going to discuss what they think is really going on. Why? Because South Florida is a sell-side market. It's a market where you eat, where you kill. And a lot of times, a lot of the information that gets out there, it's very positive, very rosy. So I want to have journalists go ahead and give us a more of a skeptical eye about what might be really going on for you, the audience. If you're looking to buy a condo, you're looking to invest in a condo, you look on the sidelines, you just want to pay attention to all that havoc and grief. This is a great uh, venue for you to be, get a good sense of what really might be happy, uh, happening. So let me go ahead and introduce you to the uh, podcast members this week. And then after that, we'll get into some rules of engagement before we get into our six stories that I am fit. So we have a gentleman who was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, he has his own public relations and marketing firm. It's no one else but John Gruss. His firm is GrussPR.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. If you want to look up John on X, which is formerly Twitter, get him at John Gruss, J-E-A-N-G-R-U-S-S. What's going on, Mr. Gruss? Hey, Peter. I'm ready to cut through the fluff. Cut through the fluff. This is an unauthorized podcaster. I'm giving you the authority to cut through the fluff, Sean. No fluff zone. No fluff zone. 100% correct. Who else do we have on the podcast? We have a gentleman, a journalist for over 20 years, wrote about white collar crime, uh, worked at publications, including South Florida Business Journal. Right now, he does public relations and marketing. It's no one else but John Fackler. If you want to get hold of Mr. Fackler, you can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at JT Fackler, J-T-F-A-K-L-E-R. 
What's going on, Mr. Fackler? Hey, Peter, glad to be back on the podcast. Visiting journalist this week. We have a gentleman who was a journalist for over 10 years. About nine years ago or so, he moved over to the public relations world. He's a senior vice president at Boardroom Communications. No one else but Eric Kalis. You want to get a hold of Eric, check him out on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at Eric, E-R-I-C underscore, which is that little line at the bottom, Kalis, K-A-L-I-S, Eric underscore Kalis. What's going on, Mr. Kalis? I am so thrilled to be back, Peter. Great to cut it up with you guys again. Glad that my maiden voyage went so well that I got a, a second invite for season five. So thrilled to be here. Excited to dive into these timely topics with you all. Well, we are happy to have you back, Mr. Kalis. Let me lay out some rules of engagement. If anybody has any comments for us, you have any questions, you want to tell us uh, that you like one of our participants more than the other, go ahead and get us on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get us at Miami RRP, at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. It is not AARP, it is Miami RRP. And then in terms of sponsorship, um, my firm is a sponsor, condovultures.com, condovultures.com. We basically track statistics, we pull data, um, we write about things that maybe the rest of the media isn't writing about, more so kind of a deep dive inside baseball type of stuff. So if you are in the condo market, if you're watching the condo market, or you're a lender, and you kind of know what's want to know what's going on in terms of the market, we're putting out the data. We're trying to give you real-time information. I encourage everybody uh, to subscribe to the newsletter, which comes out every Friday, uh, condovultures.com. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started with our stories. Mr. Gruce, John Gruce, we're going to go to you with story number one. Uh, this is coming from the Florida Bar. Uh, the Florida Bar basically is a licensing uh, entity for anybody who's a lawyer in the state of Florida. They put out um, uh, articles and things like that. So I'm going to read you the headline, first couple graphs, uh, uh, Mr. Gruce, and I want you to provide some insight. Headline, Bill to Enhance Condo Safety Measures Post Surfside Awaits Governor's Signature. And again, Surfside is a disaster that occurred in 2021. A tower collapsed right there on the ocean, uh, located between Miami Beach and Sunny Isles Beach on the Barrier Island, which is just off the coast of mainland Miami. Collapsed, nearly 100 people died. A billion-dollar payout was um, put forward. And as a result, the legislature, uh, uh, as well as the insurance companies, really pushed for some changes to make sure that it never happens again. The federal government has sent down a body to come down here, take a look at it, investigate it. They're starting to come out with some preliminary findings. Uh, the final findings probably won't be coming forward for another uh, couple of years or so. But but things are in motion. And that's what the story has to do with, uh, John. Again, Florida Bar headline, Bill to Enhance Condo Safety Measures Post Surf Site Awaits Governor's Signature. And here's the first couple graphs. After the Champlain Tower South collapse killed 98 Surfside residents in 2021, the legislature moved quickly to beef up structural inspections. Those reforms continued last month when the Senate voted 40 to nil to approve HB 1021, which now awaits Governor Ron DeSantis' signature. Um, Representative Vicky Lopez, a Republican out of Coral Gables, was a prime sponsor. Veteran Republican Jennifer Bradley, a Fleming Islands attorney who worked on the reforms for the past two years, sponsored the Senate Companion Bill, which is SB 1178. In November, a real property probate and trust law representative, a, vet, um, a veteran Miami-Dade prosecutor, and Florida's former condominium ombudsman told the Senate Regulated uh, Industries Committee that reforms are badly needed. Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine fernandez Rundle recently told the, uh, the bar's news uh, website that she was more than pleased with the final product. Mr. Gross, are you more than pleased with everything that the state of Florida is doing to try to deal with a variety of topics related to condo associations, whether it's fraud, whether it's kickback of contracts, whether it's picking the can down the line and not doing the necessary work, and whether it's the brand new 2025 law, which will require condominium associations to have done uh, engineering reports to figure out what's wrong, what needs to be done, and then actually set aside cash, which meets the uh, special assessments, so the work can actually get done. So, Mr. Cruz, are you pleased like Catherine Fernando, uh, fernandez Rundle is uh, with the legislation that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to sign? No, I'm not. I'm not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they squandered a unique opportunity to really go a lot further, um, and um, in in my opinion, uh, that. The, the number one thing that I was looking for um, was subjecting condo documents and financial statements to the state's sunshine laws. And I think that would have shined a light on all the, all the shenanigans, all the, all the crazy, all the craziness, all the problems. And uh, they didn't do that. So, you know, I think that's, uh, that would have been sort of the, the, the big number one thing that's sort of missing from this. I mean, they, they, they made, uh, 
you know, they made a few changes in terms of the criminal penalties for kickbacks and things of that nature, but they still, you know, I, I mean, they're still not, um, uh, they're still not really uh, uh, meaningful in terms of, of the depths of the problems that, that, that this market has. Um, and I, I think that, I think that they had this, this really unique opportunity, unfortunately, because of a disaster, uh, but they really, they really squandered the opportunity to make it something really significant. And in fact, they could have taken a national, the national lead in, um, in really revamping the way condos are governed and the way uh, the state uh, inspects condos and, and oversees condos. And they, they could have been, it could have been groundbreaking stuff. Uh, and instead they sort of, um, in my opinion, they sort of, sort of tinkered around the edges, uh, but you know, maybe, maybe this is better than nothing. Now, 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 Mr. Gruss, to your point, talking about, um, you know, transparency, taking the information, making it available so people can make educated decisions as to whether they want to invest in a building or they want to get out of a building simply because the work isn't getting done or, or there's findings from engineers and other stuff. So we don't see another repeat of Surfside. In this story, saw one resident who was actually per, uh, trying to obtain information related to inspection reports. They had to spend $160,000, 160000 right. just to get their hands on information to see what the results were of an inspection. Um, that doesn't well, seem right, not only for a unit owner, but somebody who might be looking to buy in that unit. Anything in this legislation that will ultimately yeah. address that? Yes, actually. So I, w I went and actually dug, dug into the legislation a little bit. And um, there, there is a provision that calls for the condo associations to put this information on a public website. Um, now, uh, you know, the definition of public website is not entirely clear to me. Um, uh, it's, um, I don't know if it's like a, a website for the residents, for the unit owners. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure that it's going to be a pu public record in the same way that you and I could, could request, um, you know, court documents as a public record or, or police reports as a public record. Um, which I think, I think we should have made condo documents and fin uh, the financials and the documents you know, on, on that, on par with court records and police reports and other, you know, other documents that are subject to the sunshine law to shine the light on, on the malfeasance and the, and the misappropriation of funds and all the problem, because you can have a huge law you can have a huge enforcement division, uh, at the state division of corporate, uh, state, uh, state condo division. You could have this army of, of inspectors, but really it's, it's the, shining of the lights on, on the problems, uh, that would really help, you know, clear a lot of this, of this nonsense, uh, that, that we've got. And they, I think they missed that opportunity. Um, Eric Kalis, we're going to you with story number two. This piece is coming out of the BBC and, uh, it has to do with Jamie Dimon. Jamie uh, Dimon runs JP Morgan Chase. Uh, so look to him as, uh, probably one of the best bankers on wall street. He's a little bit on the bearish side, which means he's a little chicken, little, a little pessimistic. So that's kind of the background, uh, Eric. I'm going to go ahead and read you the headline, uh, first couple of graphs, and I want you to provide some insight. So headline, Jamie Dimon says that the U.S. interest rates could rise to 8%. Now, the story doesn't clarify if he's talking about U.S. federal funds rate, which is right now 5.25 to 5.5, or if he's talking about the overall um, interest rate, I'm guessing on mortgages or maybe the 10 year treasury. So it's a little bit uh, vague, but we're just going to run with that. So here we go with the first couple of graphs, um, Eric, then I want you to comment. Have the boss of one of the world's biggest banks has warned US interest rates could climb to 8%. Jamie Dimon, the head of JP Morgan Chase, said his bank has prepared for interest rates to jump because of persistent inflationary pressure. Central banks around the world have been busy raising rates in a bid to dampen rising prices. But the U but with US inflation gradually easing, the overwhelming expectation is for the Federal Reserve to cut rates this year. Markets are uh, pricing in two quarter point rate cuts in 2024. I will mention at one point it was six that they were looking at uh, when we were going into 2024. And then the story goes on to say in his annual letter to shareholders, Mr. Diamond said that bank uh, that the bank was ready for a very, very broad range of rates from 2% to 8% or even higher, potentially pushed up because of high government spending and the need to curb price rises. 
Um, Eric, last time you were on in season four, I think you, we also gave you a Jamie Diamond story where he was also a uh, chicken little. He was a little bit bearish. And at the time, I think he was talking about 7% interest rate. Um, we don't see that yet today. So I'm wondering, why don't you give the audience some perspective about Mr. D uh, Diamond's ability to predict the future and also more so his argument that because of um, uh, the variety of government spend nets out there that, uh, you know, it might be necessary to try to uh, calm inflation. What say you, Mr. Kalis? Yes, I am two for two on uh, Jamie Diamond <laughs> related interest rate topics. And this is actually perfect timing for me because I just got back from the Urban Land Institute Florida Summit, the annual event this year was in downtown Tampa. It was uh, phenomenal. And not surprisingly, the uh, interest rates were a big topic of discussion with real estate experts from all sectors weighing in. And I will say that there were at least two veteran real estate professionals in panel discussions who at least floated the idea of zero rate cuts in 2024. And that was the first time that I've heard explicit references to zero because the conventional wisdom, you're right, we, we had... We had heard maybe six last year, and then at the onset of this year, it's it, three has been the number that's been thrown around a lot. This was the first time I heard zero, and the CBRE economist who made a presentation, kind of a keynote presentation, Spencer Levy, he also floated that idea, but stood by his prediction, a very soft prediction of three rate cuts, with the caveat that last week's jobs report, not to put an exact date on this, because I know people will tune into this at different times, but the most recent jobs report was so positive that it gave them pessimism about the three rate cuts. So it seems like somewhere between zero and two, which is certainly not going to bring a lot of relief to those who have been waiting on the sidelines, especially the commercial real estate players. We, we've been at a very stalled commercial real estate market you know, particularly multifamily office where, you know, there are people that would love to swoop in and, and acquire stuff right now because multiple experts during the ULI summit said this is a generational commercial real estate buying opportunity right now. But the interest rate environment combined with the insurance costs, especially in Florida, has everybody still on the sidelines. So, 8% is not something I'm hearing from anybody else, but starting to hear noise about zero Fed rate cuts being a possibility in 2024. Another nugget from the discussions was the new normal is going to be a 5.5 to 6% interest rate. That's ultimately going to be where we land. Uh, in the home buying market, the, the people that myself included were able to refinance during COVID get under 3%, we're going to have to have a reality check. If we want to move forward you know, with our life plans and trade up, like I was mentioning earlier in this program, that a 5.5 interest rate or a 6% 6 .6 interest rate is going to be the new normal. And our parents and grandparents will tell you, that's pretty dang good. I mean, how many, how many people have you talked to in life that bought homes in the early 80s just love to tell you, how high their interest rate was. I mean, they, they just can't wait to tell you about their 13% interest rate. So there's going to be a reality check. People are going to come to terms with this and things will start to loosen up again in 2025. I, I believe Jean made the very astute point last time I was on um, in reference to Jamie Dimon that, you know, the banks have some major balance sheet issues and they have a vested interest in interest rates, uh, you know, continuing to be elevated. I, I'm certainly by no means the banking expert, so I'll, I'll defer to, to Jean and the rest of the panel on that. But, you know, Jamie Dimon never says these things in a vacuum, I guess is the, the main point that I'm trying to make as far as, uh, you know, his, uh, his interest rate predictions. And he likes to keep his options open as well. Jean is Jamie Dimon talking his book is 8%, which obviously uh, benefited him from a bottom line perspective. Um, is he talking his book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his his job is to protect the bank. I mean, that's as simple as that. And if uh, if rates are going up to eight percent, he needs to know like what his bank is, how his bank is going to manage. Um, and um, you know, I mean, it's just going to be a different environment. The the one thing I will say is 
I mean, <laughs> I mean, if, if, if anything in the last few years we've learned is that um, the guys at the Federal Reserve um, cannot be trusted at all <laughs> to tell us anything uh, correctly. I mean, they completely missed the inflation call. You know, um, the, the interest rates rose at, at their fastest rate ever. And, you know, every other day we have a Fed governor, a different Fed governor coming out talking about, you know, what they think uh, interest rates will be, uh, you know, so one day it's seven cuts, the next day, three cuts, the next day it's no cuts, you know, so like all these Fed governors are out there yakking away and nobody knows like, wh well, what, what is the path? You know, what is the trajectory? And I mean, you just look at the bond market, uh, 10 year treasury goes up and down like every day, like by major swings. It's, it's just crazy. And the 10 year treasury is what, you know, commercial real estate and, and, and so much of the real estate world's lending is based on. You, you cannot have these wild swings in the 10 year treasury without, without affecting, uh, you know, real estate and particularly commercial real estate. Um, but, but also residential real estate. So, you know, you, you never know, like, you know, should I wait a month? I mean, are rates going to go down? Like, and then you get all this conflicting, um, all these conflicting reports and everybody's got an opinion and it's, it's, um, really, I, I, I feel like, um, every time someone from the federal reserve opens their mouth, it's a different story and you, you, you just, you just have to like be prepared, uh, for the possibility that, yeah, maybe 8%. I mean, who the hell knows? Jamie Dimon may be right. You know, nobody's brought it up or, or maybe that there won't be any cuts this year. I mean, I think that's entirely realistic because we don't, because the Federal Reserve itself, the, the Board of Governors has no idea what they're talking about. Uh, we don't know. You know, they've missed so many calls and they, they just talk incessantly. And one governor says one thing and another says another thing. You can't get a straight story out of them. So, yeah, I mean, I think you just have to be prepared. Interesting conversation, gentlemen. Um, we're going to go ahead with story number three. Mr. Fackler, we're going to go to you with story number three, John Fackler. This piece coming out of Miami today. I'll read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple graphs, and I want you to comment, Mr. Fackler. Headline, everybody wants to live in Florida, anywhere but Miami. And this is an opinion piece written by Michael Lewis, who is the publisher over at Miami Today. I uh, formerly worked at the Miami News. I worked for uh, Michael Lewis. Uh, Eric, you worked for Michael Lewis. My director. first journalism yeah, so. job. Very grateful to yeah. Mr. Lewis, who I still refer to as Mr. Lewis uh, nearly two decades later. <laughs> Mr. Lewis, yeah, 100%. <laughs> so um, uh, this is his editorial. And uh, Mr. Beck, I want you to comment. Um, here we go. Headline, everybody wants to live in Florida anywhere but Miami. If we believe our own publicity, Miami Dade is booming as people from across the nation rush to live here and our population soars. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your view, it just ain't so. The fact is the county's population is nearly 15,000 people smaller, yes, smaller than it was just at the start of the pandemic four years ago. That's what U.S. Census numbers released last week show. Don't be misled by the Census Bureau's news release that Florida's absolutely booming in population growth with four of the nation's five fastest growing metropolitan areas last year being in the state. The report is true, but it doesn't mention Miami-Dade, which trails far behind the rest of the state's 14 metropolitan areas in population flows. Since April uh, 1st of 2020, of uh, Florida's 67 counties, 60 have added people as residents from the rest of the nation flocked to the state. The seven losers were five small and poor population counties in North Florida. Our neighbors, Monroe County in the Florida Keys, which is the Florida Keys and surprise, Miami-Dade County. So... Mr. Fackler, why don't you give us your take as to Mr. Lewis's his, and, and his reading of the numbers? There was a couple of interesting nuggets that Mr. Lewis mentioned in his editorial, and one of, the, uh, one of them relates to the story we just got done talking about. Apparently, there's been an exodus of middle-class workers, these same workers that were drawn in um, by the uh, lucrative promises of uh, new tech jobs. What happened was... Uh, they came and then they left, or they never came. And basically, they're comparing uh, the numbers, uh, which include by, includes, by the way, the international, uh, which seems like a still getting a huge number of international um, uh, residents um, into Miami, but they're mostly very rich, uh, all the very poor. And anybody who's middle class is, seems to be moving away and 
you know, when you look at the numbers, when you comparatively to all the other counties uh, and all the other cities within Florida, I mean, Miami is, is dead in the water. So you wonder how this is going to affect things going forward as far as development, a development of new condos, new apartments. You know, what's going to happen here going forward, I think, is, is it was something that was a concern that Mr. Lewis pointed out in the piece. Like, you know, the business people need to, they need to wonder, worry about what's going on now, not about development in the future, because right now things are not looking good business-wise in Miami. Now, 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 Mr. Beckler, let me ask you one follow-up question for you until I open up to the floor. So there's a line in the editorial now near the bottom that says, it's highly troubling that qualified people who actually work here leave in greater numbers than they can be replaced. So yes. Mr. Beckler, if the real workers are leaving and we get 15,000 people less than we did prior to the pandemic, um, how can rents go up? That I'm not really sure. You know, Miami's a quirky place as far as that goes. Um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a certain thinking about when, when, even when you go shopping for groceries, you know, suddenly, you know, business is slow, but they raise the prices. So I'm wondering <laughs> if this, <laughs> we've talked about that in the past. So I'm wondering if there's sort of like a thinking that goes into it that, okay, listen, you know, this is the way we're going to recap our money. You know, we're getting, we're not getting new residents. So let's raise the prices. I don't know if that's the reason, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me because I, I, you know, Miami's very quirky when it comes to that. Um, uh, Eric, uh, Mr. Groose, can either of you sort of answer that question? If we got 15,000 people less than we did, if the qualified people were actually working can't be replaced, why are rents going up? So all the, all the market data I've seen over the last, let's say four quarters is that rents have actually softened in, in my, opinion. okay. So rents, you know, they, they may not be going down in a significant way, but they've certainly flatlined, uh, the, the pandemic era rent frenzy has certainly cooled off in a major way. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to quibble with Mr. Lewis's headline, which admittedly is is catchy in the sense that I think the original headline is that people want to live in Florida, but don't want to live in Miami. Is, is that kind of, That's the headline. It's people can't live in Miami. The desire is there, the ability to, and, and John nailed it where there's been a complete evaporation of, of the middle class. And, and by the way, this was exacerbated by the pandemic. It's not a new trend and not to personalize everything uh, and make my own story a microcosm for, for what's going on. But in 2013, uh, my wife and I would have loved to stay in Coral Gables. I mean, we were renting in the Gables. We're at a point where we wanted to buy. We wanted to figure out where we were going to buy. Do you think... You know, somebody who was still a journalist and my wife was one or two years removed from a journalist was going to be able to buy anything in and around Coral Gables. So what happens is your first time buyers, your middle class, when it comes time to really start their lives and put down roots, they go up north. And for us, uh, it was Cooper City. And if you went to my neighborhood, you would see so many cops that work in Miami Dade. I have a Miami Shores cop a couple doors down from me. Miami Beach, uh, you name it, teachers who work in Miami-Dade County, firefighters, they're all settling and buying you know, when they, and it's all the same demo, you know, recently married or married for a few years, maybe one kid or they move there and start a family. That was the migration in 2013. What's happened now is now people are getting priced out of Broward and going north and getting priced out of Palm Beach County and going to St. Lucie and, and on and on and, and all the way up, up the state. But the pandemic really exacerbated it, exacerbated it because we had so much wealth flowing in to Miami. And, you know, that's why a lot of the, the tech bros packed their things up and went to California <laughs> because <laughs> they realized, you know, they, uh, the the CEOs bought these incredible homes and penthouses here and did the tax harvesting thing here and, and leased you know did expensive record setting office leases in Wynwood and and in Brickell but then they realized there wasn't anywhere where their rank and file employees could live exactly so all that wealth just exacerbated a problem that's existed for many years and I don't see any sort of an elixir in sight. Sean, um, let, let, let me just ask you, based on what Eric had mentioned, um, uh, 
you know, a lot of things are sort of uh, unpacked there. But at the end yeah. of the day, if you got fewer people, um, shouldn't rents go down? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, there's first of all, there's a tsunami of apartments that's that's on that's coming. I mean, it's just a huge number of apartments are being developed and built, and that is going to for sure drive down rents. Um, now, yeah, now, yeah. now, yeah. now, now, Jean, if I could just uh, piggyback on that, um, well, you know, what, one of the one of the criticisms of the Federal Reserve when they're going ahead and they're running inflation numbers, they're coming out with CPI, and by the way, they'll be coming out with yeah. this this week. One of the things is, is that housing data is supposed to be old. It's supposed to be late. It's not supposed to be um, pertaining to what's really going on. I know from running statistics, it's virtually impossible to get your hands on good rental information. It's all just a survey. There's no way to really track it like there are transactions where there's a deed recorded and there's some sort of third party. Do you think part of this uh, argument that rents are going up is simply the fact that the landlords who are providing this information on a voluntary survey are simply just lying? Is that a possibility or am I totally out of left field? Well, if you're a landlord, you certainly don't want rents to go down. <laughs> and you're not, you're not, you're, you're not going to, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is not going to talk down the market. You know, uh, I mean, the Realtor Association is not going to talk down the market. I mean, you know, everybody who has a vested interest in keeping rents high is not going to talk down the market. You know, as, as far as population, um, the population trends, I mean, the fact of the matter is Miami Dade is built out. So there's no, big tracts of land left developed uh, to build, you know, thousands of units. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think sometimes when you're comparing, say, Miami-Dade's uh, population to other counties and you're like, well, look, see, Miami-Dade isn't growing at all. Well, that's because we're out of land. Makes I mean, sense. The, the other thing, too, is that as far as, far as the rents are concerned, I, I think that um, uh, if, if, if you look at Florida's history, um, and I'm, I'm talking about housing prices too, I mean, we're, the state is boom and bust. And, you know, if, if, you, if you had come here uh, in 2008 or 2009, there would have been plenty of affordable housing. I mean, you could have picked up a bunch of foreclosed homes, you know? So, I mean, this, this is just like the, the, the history of Florida is boom and bust. And during booms, I mean, housing affordability is a, is a terrible problem. I mean, look back at 2005. You look back at 2004 <laughs> and 2005 and see exactly the same stories about affordable housing, everybody complaining, people are leaving, people won't come to Florida, it's too expensive. Boom, great financial crisis, like plenty of affordable housing. Everybody piles back into Florida. Florida's the number one fastest growing state. Everybody's piling in, buying up all these cheap homes and all of a sudden, all these homes are now. I mean, it's the story of Florida. Fantastic conversation. Fantastic conversation. Um, uh, Jean, we're going to go to you with story number four. This is coming out of the Orlando Business Journal. Uh, we've talked a lot in season five about um, what's going on with condo associations, some of the fraud, some of the uh, changes that were put in place as a result of the collapse of Champlain Tower South and Surfside on the Barrier Island between Miami Beach and Sunny Isles Beach. Let me read you a headline the first couple graphs, Sean, and then I just want you to sort of um, provide some insight to some of the particulars in this uh, in this piece, and it and it does include a Q and A with somebody who basically advises on some of these condo buildings. So here's a headline: Orlando-based condo advisor offers the big reason Florida's condo market is dire. The culture wasn't working. And here's from the story: In the wake of a 2021 uh, Florida law, condo owners are facing a variety of new requirements, especially massive fees following the collapse of the Champlain Tower. In Surfside, the legislature passed a, a statute requiring, among other things, that buildings over 30 years old, 20 years if it's on the coast, be inspected and collect reserve capital from owners in order to make repairs. In some cases, these could result in assessment as high as $100,000 a door over the next year of, uh, for the individual uh, owners. John Caden is an Orlando-based managing principal of the Condominium Advisor Group, a consultant group formed after the Surfside collapse. A Chicago native, he's worked in Central Florida since 2008. He stressed that the issues will be a problem in Central Florida, not just on the coast. The story goes on to uh, uh, address a bunch of different topics, John, that are kind of going on here. And let me read you one of the one of his responses to a question that I want you to comment because we've talked big picture about it, but I want to kind of talk about uh, micro if we can. So, so the question is regarding current condo owners facing an astronomical assessment. Is there a way around that or any help for these individual owners? And the scenario is you bought a condo; it's an old ass building. Uh, suddenly you have to do engineering study 
Uh, you have to figure out how old is the roof, how, you know, what's going on with the balconies, are the rebar, is it given way, you got to change it, what's going on in the foundation, a variety of different things. And then once you do this engineering study, you have to begin to immediately allocate cash to start to address to resolve the problem. So that's the big picture that you're dealing with if you own a condominium or if you think about buying a condominium. So again, the question is regarding current condo owners facing astronomical assessments, is there a way around that or any help for them? And the gentleman, his response is, I think it will run the gamut. There are people who are going to get crushed. There are people who might find some programs out there where they can get along to some level to help them pay. Those really high assessments, that's mostly going to be on the much older building. I don't really think there's a good answer. If you're living on a fixed income and you're in one of these buildings that hasn't been taken care of, that has all of these issues where your building was just avoiding these issues, some people are just going to be out. And those are the ones you're really going to hear about in the newspaper. John, um, a building built, say, prior to 2000, do these buildings have any chance or should they just cut bait, try to terminate and get the hell up? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I mean, they're just darn lucky that we're now in a real estate. We're still in a real estate uh, uptrend. So, I mean, if, if this was happening in a downturn, I mean, they would get crushed, but they have an out. They can sell out to a developer who can take take down the building and terminate the condos and build something new and they can take the cash and go somewhere else. Um, if they, if, if this had been like, if we had been in a situation like the great financial crisis and this was happening now, I mean, these people really be like in a, in a, in bad shape. So there is an out and that is you sell your condo to a developer and and this it's it's the only way out that I can see because yeah, but John, John, I went on Zillow and I looked up my place and it's worth a million dollars a door. How am I going <laughs> to sell for anything less than that? Now, granted, this special <laughs> system it might be a hundred grand based on what the story says. So, I mean, how do you square that? Look, I mean, what you think is worth uh, may may not be realistic, or it may not be what the market uh, will bear at this time. But there's a good chance right now that you're property is worth more than it was, say, when you bought 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and perhaps you're in a great location and a developer is eager to uh, terminate the condo, tear it down, put up something new and, and fancy, you know. Uh, I, I think that's that's your only way out. Um, otherwise, you have to pay the special assessments. And, and um, you know, the problem is, is that you're not you're not the only owner in the building, you know, so you're, you're, you're a fraction of the, of the building. And so you have to be able to get along with everybody else. And, and, uh, that, that's really going to cause a lot of friction. And I mean, there's some people that just don't want to move for, for whatever reason. Um, I, I think it's being short-sighted. Um, but you know, honestly, I think if you're, if you're, if you're in a condo now, uh, or if you're contemplating buying a condo now, uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty surrounding, you know, the costs. I mean, not just renovating and and bringing it up to code, but I mean, insurance and common area maintenance and all those things are unpredictable right now. And I think I think um, this this kind of uncertainty um, is going to drive a lot of people away from condos, um, and it's going to give an opportunity to developers who are who have been eyeing, you know, some properties and to tear down and, and redevelop. And I, I think that's actually a healthy, good thing. Yeah, let, let, let me just read one more quote from this and then we'll wrap up this story. And we'll move on to the next story. Um, there, there, there's a quote in here from the expert and he says, what an engineer or a reserve advisor is doing is looking at the main components of your property. Those are the studies that are supposed to be undertaken by 2025, both structurally and not structurally. And they say your roof has three years left, so you need a reserve. They're going to calculate what you need to put away from the new roof. Maybe it's just stuck on the wall with any common area components. They're going to look at the remaining life and they're going to calculate what you need to put away to replace it. The fact is nobody's been doing that up to this yeah. point. Even if they had a reserve study done, they simply didn't do it. They waited until the roof had to be replaced and then they might do a special assessment. But all that is coming to an end. So I just yeah. want to put that out to the audience so they get a, a sense of what's coming come 2025 because you need to have that in place if you're a condominium in the state of Florida. So let's go yeah. on this story. Um, let, let's go on to story number five. We're going to go to Eric Kalis. Eric, um, this is a piece that's coming out of the Business Insider. I'm going to read you the headline for a couple of graphs and I want you to comment. And keep in mind, um, you know, background for this story or the context is 
lot of people are saying that uh, Miami is going to be really in South Florida is going to be dealing with a lot of issues with the global sea level rise because we're effectively below sea level or right on the verge of sea level, depending on how you measure it. So here we go with the headline in the first couple of graphs, Eric, then I want you to comment again, Business Insider. Miami shows how a new kind of gentrification is coming to U.S. cities. Here's the first couple of graphs, Eric, then I want you to comment. Miami is one of the hottest real estate markets in the country. A flood of transplants over the last several years has pushed home prices and ranked even higher in the South Florida metropolis, making it harder for low-income Floridians to afford the city. But gentrification in Miami is layered with the very real impacts of the climate crisis, which makes living in the city's many low-lying areas and waterfront neighborhoods increasingly perilous, despite the desirable ocean views and proximity to the beach. Some of the city's lower-income communities are farther inland and on higher ground than traditionally ritzier areas. That makes them safer from rising sea levels, but more at risk for so-called climate gentrification as Miami's wealthier residents begin to snap up land and homes in less flood-prone areas. Eric, I'm just wondering, um, you know, you, you're in the public relations game right now. You used to work and write about real estate for a decade. Right now you're working on behalf of developers, builders, other uh, sites. I'm just wondering, um, you know, A, what's your thought about it? Is Miami kind of reflection of what we're probably going to see around the country, especially in areas where global sea level rise could really have an effect? And then B, how difficult would it be from a, a public relations marketing perspective to pitch something that's inland rather than something that's right in the water. Well, I, I happen to represent both uh, coastal and inland development. So I, oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. So I certainly uh, know how to market the uh, the pros and cons of of both. And yeah, you know, just to touch on the um, the business insider piece uh, before we get into to that, um, because like a lot of times when these national reporters kind of try to parachute in and and uh, talk about what's going on in Miami. The piece is really disjointed. It's kind of all over the place <laughs> and it's conflating various trends that, you know, the, the case of, of the gentrification it talks about has been going on for quite some time now in terms of there's been massive, look at Miami World Center. That's 20 years in the making, essentially in yep. Overtown. That yep. area... I was just there for for an event uh, at the beginning of March, and I was blown away by the high end retailers that are at Miami World Center. If you told me in the two thousands that, that that those kind of you know Lincoln Road caliber, design district caliber type retailers would be there, I, I'd tell you you're crazy. So now now now, granted, Mister K, listen, my office is uh, right next to that. Granted, nobody's in these retailers, but. They're all they're here. all here. They're, they're all paying so the forth. exorbitant rents yeah. to be, you know, what was yep. previously Overtown Park West. The, the Magic City Innovation District has been in various stages of development for many years in Little Haiti. These neighborhoods have been targeted for redevelopment because the coastal neighborhoods and the nearby urban core neighborhoods, they're out of land. This is where the the cheaper land that developers could assemble and build these you know multi faceted long term mixed use transformative types of developments that's where the opportunity existed so th this is not you know developers being freaked out about sea level rise and shying away from the coast i promise you these developers if they could tie down large scale development sites on the water they would be doing it in a second, especially if they, it, 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 these are, this is economically driven and it's long term. So, yeah, you know, the, I think this national publication was going for a provocative headline and using a phrase that I'm sure is going to become a national cliche, like so many others, um, not to be dismissive of the impacts of sea level rise and, and climate change. I'm certainly not you know, trying to dismiss that. I'm just trying to give our viewers and listeners an insight into the thought process of these developers and what drives them for these long-term projects. These neighborhoods that are mentioned in the story have been development targets for many, many years and decades in the case of, of where Miami World Center is. So th this has been a, a long-term process. So going back to your your question about how do you market, you know, these projects. Yes. And there's certainly an advantage to um, with an inland project, you know, kind of uh, leveraging the fact that a project is inland. And with one Coral Gables project that was completed 
uh, five years ago that we worked on, we would actually do write-ups where we we determined the ex- elevation and looked at the, the maps, the exact elevation of the site, and showed that not only was this particular project in an inland location, but it was actually almost twice as elevated as the average in Miami-Dade County. So we were actually using messaging about elevation, you know, explaining how that's a defense against flooding, um, all the benefits of being in an inland elevated site when it comes to that project. Generally speaking, when you have a great location, you don't have to give a lot of stuff because people come in for the location. But as you go into, you go out west, 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 you got to give more stuff to kind of sweeten the pot to get the people to move in. You, can you see any marketing um, uh, movement, at least at this point, where maybe the elevation is a selling point rather than the stuff, where you can give less stuff like you do on the coast and you're able to sell it strictly based on elevation? Or is this an out-of-towner parachuting in and telling us what we should be thinking? And unless you're like really hardcore in the global sea level rise, you really don't give a shit. I think it can be part of the narrative and it can be an effective part of the narrative. And it doesn't necessarily have to be elevation in inland locations you can also promote okay. it maybe it's a project on a site in a coastal submarket that is at a significantly higher elevation than its neighbors or than than the Got competitive it. set so it doesn't have to necessarily be in coastal submarket versus an inland thing it can be differentiating your project from its counterparts because the reality is a potential buyer in one of these coastal projects is going to probably be choosing between a couple of different coastal projects. They've already made that choice of where they want to buy and where they want to be. So they may have to get more granular in their marketing or promote what they're doing as developers to mitigate against these impacts as well. Interesting conversation. Uh, Thank you, Eric. Um, John Fatal, let me go to you with story number six. Uh, Mr. Facto, this piece comes out of KTLA out in Los Angeles Television uh, Network. Um, we're in South Florida. This piece is out of Southern California, but I think there's some overlap. Mr. Facto, you used to write about white collar crime. You're a go-to guy when it comes to giving advice to owners and condominiums or residents um, as to how to avoid certain issues. So I want to see if you can offer any advice to our audience about this particular circumstance. And I'll read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs. And I want you to comment, Mr. Packler. Headline, residents of Southern California condo complex living in fear of their neighbor. After months of scary incidents and vandalism, some residents of a Long Beach condo complex say they're tired of living in fear of a neighbor. Multiple people who live in the Gladys Avenue condo complex spoke with KTLA Channel 5, Sarah Wealth, saying that a man had threatened them and broken several windows of their homes in the building. Neighbors are afraid of what he'll do next. Many of the condos are owned by occupants, making it even more difficult for them to move. And here's a quote from somebody called Desi Ambrosa. Once or twice a month, this gentleman will come outside of his apartment, break somebody's window, and then go back inside. His windows have been broken out for a very long time now. A woman who lives in one of the units says she carries a taser with her out of fear for her safety. Ambrosa says the woman is scared of the man's unpredictable behavior. Quote goes on to say, They don't feel safe going in to even get their mail. They don't feel safe taking their trash out. They feel like they're uh, constantly on guard. There have been several complaints filed about the man's behavior. Neighbors say they caught him urinating in the common areas, uh, smashing commandos and vehicle windows, as well as verbally accosting residents. Mr. Fackler, you used to live in a condo. You've lived in rental communities. A, have you ever had a situation like this? And B, what would you recommend to anybody living in a multifamily type of uh, uh, development, whether it's a rental or it's a condo? How do you deal with a situation like this? Because obviously, whatever the hell this association is doing, it's not working. Well, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting because I don't think there's much recourse. The cops have been called on this guy several times. The HOA is sort of on the fence. It's not really clear what they've been doing. Um, you have to understand, this guy is an actual owner. He's been a, an owner for 20 years. So you have to wonder, you know, is that playing into this? Because look, you know, there's owners and there's also renters in this complex. So do the do the owners get favorable treatment? I mean, that, that might be what's going on here too as well. Uh, they had a picture of this guy. He had a, a he had a black t shirt that says "I'm evil." So it was, and for some reason, it was it was blurred out by the uh, reporters. Uh, he had a red hat, but that was blurred out too. 
So, and I'm not trying to insinuate anything, but uh, I think there's an issue here where it's getting to the point of no return. Um, also, California is very similar to Florida in that it has a stand your own stand your ground law, but it also has another thing that's called, and I don't, I just can't recall the name of it, where you could actually um, uh, stand your ground as far as someone breaking into your na- your apartment. So, you know, listen, I'm not a gun owner. But if that's the case and things are out of control, I would recommend buying a gun. You know, the guy breaks in, you shoot him. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not pro gun, but I'm saying this has gotten to the point where, you know, I mean, your life could be literally on the line. So, um, so, 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 so Mr. Fackler, uh, generally speaking in a condo association, I was on a board for a number of years. So if this gentleman's doing a variety of different things, the only real way the association can go after him is to find him. They can, right. they can impose a fine. And then if you don't pay your fine, ultimately, they can turn it over to a law firm. Law firm will, will go forward and try to foreclose. So if you get fined and you pay off the fine, basically, it, make, it goes away. It's like you're asking. You don't ask for permission. You ask for forgiveness, oh, really? if you will. Yeah. Well, that's so, interesting. Ba- based on my experience. So yeah. given a situation like this, Mr. Fat Clerk, you know, short of buying a gun, and anybody doesn't know what stand your ground is, you basically don't have to, you don't have to run. If somebody comes at you, you can stand your ground and defend yourself. So, and I don't know about California, but if you say it's true in California, it's true in California. But Mr. Fact, there's any other way other than simply to sell, um, to deal with this situation? Because if fining is your only possibility, short of the police arresting somebody, what, uh, what other options would someone have? And I'm sure there's someone in the audience listening or watching that's dealing with a problem or a troublesome neighbor. Well, they brought this point up in the story. Uh, there's at least three, maybe more uh, owners who are trying to move out, but it takes so long to sell a place, whether you're having problems there or not, that it's it's almost a non-starter for them. They can't they, they're stuck there in a way. But I'm also curious if in the HOA docs there's anything about um, about uh, causing uh, criminal mischief. I mean, is there? You know, you're talking about getting fined. Now, is, now, is now, now generally, to... generally speaking, what happens on the way in? Uh, they'll screen you, but a lot of condominium association declarations. This is the rules of engagement. What they'll say is that if the association rejects somebody, they have to go forward and they have to buy the condo themselves. So it's basically bullshit. No, wow. no condo association is going to buy the unit. So it's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. But but, it's just but another no, reason not to buy a condo. I mean, can I ask well, John a question? Yes, please. Eric. You, you mentioned, Florida, you Florida, mentioned Florida. a red hat. So I just want to know, do we know this guy's whereabouts on January 6th, 2021? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I wasn't trying to implicate uh, our friends in the MAGA movement, but uh, it was kind of ironic that he had this red hat on and uh, they blurred it out. I'm not sure, you know, this is California, of course, so they're very uh, conscious of that type of thing. But <laughs> well, well if, you, if you are watching this podcast, you see it uh, right below Mr. Fackler's uh, video, his X account, which is JT Fackler, J-T-F-A-K-L-E-R. And if you're listening to the podcast and you want to send him a message related to his comment about the red hat, send it to at JT Factor, J T F A K L E R. Sorry, Mr. Packer, continue. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to have a bunch of crazies after my ass. Um, no, really, I was not implicating anything, anybody in that. So I really, you know, it's one of these things that, uh, again, you know, every time I look at uh, HOAs and, and condo associations and, you know, how much uh, power they have and how, how little information is given to a buyer, uh, at, into their HOA, um, it makes me really wonder, like, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the point, you know, just rent. Yeah. I'll tell you, we've been getting a lot of these stories in Florida, you know, these crazies running around and causing trouble, but, um, you know, to read to, it's almost satisfying to hear that it's happening in California and other places because it's not just us. Misery loves company. Uh, Jean yes, Bruce, does. Eric Kalis, does anybody have any thoughts? Mr. Fackler, obviously short of having, uh, telling people to get a gun. <laughs> Uh, doesn't really have a, a solution. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Groose, Mr. Kalis, uh, either of you have any uh, solutions? I'll just say that based on what the, I read in the article, the the, uh, the residents and the authorities have done base everything, anything that they can. I think if I read correctly, restraining orders were filed against this guy. The cops have investigated. I think the guy's been criminally charged. I don't know what more you can do from a legal perspective. I'm not going to go as far as uh, 
recommending the purchase of firearms, although uh, <laughs> certainly respect their <laughs> Second Amendment right to, uh, to protect themselves and their families. So it, it's a tough one. Mr. Goose, any comment before we wrap up this podcast? Well, well, this is this is the challenge of, of living in a condo, right? I mean, because you're not the only one. You're not the only owner. You're you're a fractional owner of a, of a building, and um, uh, this is and this is you're going to be living with people who who are owners, and you may not like them, and they may not like you, <laughs> and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So uh, another another thing to think about when you're buying into a condo building. Fantastic way to end the podcast. I want to go ahead and thank Sean Gruce. He was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, he's owned a public relations marketing firm called Gruce Communications. You can check out his website, grucepr.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. Also get him on X, which is formerly Twitter, at Jean Gruce, J-E-A-N-G-R-U-S-S. I want to thank John Fackler. John is the voice of reason for our podcast. Anything white collar <laughs> crime related, anything related to contractors and theft and fraud, all that type of stuff. John was a journalist for over 20 years. He wrote about white collar crime. Right now, he does public relations and marketing. You can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter, at JT Factor, J T F A K L E R. So, anybody who likes the red hats or dislikes the red hats, be sure to send Mr. Fackler a message on X. God. And I, and I also want to thank Eric Kalis. Eric was a journalist for 10 years. Nine years ago, he made the transition into the public relations and marketing world. Right now, he's a senior vice president with Boardroom Communications. I'd encourage you to check him out and look up Boardroom Communications. If you want to reach him on X, which is formerly Twitter, get him at Eric underscore Kalis, E-R-I-C underscore, that little line at the bottom, then Kalis, K-A-L-I-S. So thank you all three for participating. I'm Peter Zalewski of Count of Vultures. If you have any questions for us, you have any comments, anything about red hats that Mr. Factor referred to, get us on X, which is formerly Twitter, at Miami RRP at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast, not AARP, but Miami RRP. And also, too, my firm sponsored the podcast. I encourage you to check out our website, condovultures.com. So until next time, I hope everybody takes care of themselves and we'll catch up soon. Ciao, ciao. It's a simple formula and it works. Buy low, sell high. We're Condo Vultures. And when it comes to your real estate, we help you buy low. At Condo Vultures, we represent the buyer. And now's the time to buy. Log on to condovultures.com for more information. Condovultures.com. And remember, before you sell high, you have to buy low. Featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, and Time Magazine. Condo Vultures Realty, a licensed Florida real estate brokerage capitalizing on the condo correction since 2006. This is Peter Zalewski of the Condo Vultures Podcast. Before I started doing these podcasts, I was in the business of being a licensed real estate broker, a contributing columnist for the Miami Shield, as well as the Miami a Real Deal, but also extra witness work in consulting. So if you are looking for an expert witness or if you're looking for consulting services, a straight talk perspective as to what's going on in a particular marketplace, a building, or the, what happened previously for whatever your situation is, whether you are an attorney whether you are an institutional fund looking to invest or whether you're a lender who's trying to come up with some sort of a strategy and approach for your lending committee going forward, I don't just want to be able to help you to get a hold of me. Please reach out to Peter at condovultures.com. That's Peter at condovultures.com. Or give me a call to the office at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859.